So I'm the director for uh, the Central Florida Intelligence Community Center of Academic Excellence, which is a uh, ODNI sponsored uh, center here at UCF and in consortium with Seminole State and Daytona State College. I'm joined here today by uh, a really excellent group of uh, UCF colleagues. Uh, we have uh, Gary Adams, uh, who's a, a PhD student in our Security Studies PhD program. We have <clears throat> um, Mike Macedonia, who is a uh, assistant vice, I mean, the assistant vice president uh, for research, who also has tremendous experience uh, with uh, the US Defense Department in a number of different capacities. We have <clears throat> Uh, Miroslav uh, Shapovalov, who, re uh, who recently defended his uh, dissertation last year in security studies and who has real genuine on the ground expertise uh, in uh, the Ukraine. We have Professor Vladimir Solinari, who is a professor of history at UCF, specializing in Russian history. And then we have uh, Professor Michael Mousseau, who's a, a professor of international relations here in the School of Politics, International Affairs and Security. So we are so happy to have you here. Um, the way we're going to work today is uh, I'm going to uh, provide a very brief introduction to some of the issues, uh, and then uh, we're going to go uh, to each of our panelists. Each of our panelists are going to talk for about five minutes, and <clears throat> after that, uh, we'll, we'll entertain questions. If you can chat questions that you might be interested in asking to me, uh, that would be great, uh, and I will leave the questions off because I certainly know we have a number of people uh, joining us today. So, some people might be wondering what this conflict in Ukraine is all about. Um, in my view, and please note that all of us are expressing our opinions. Uh, none of us have particular insight uh, from you know, secret sources or anything. But in my view, what we're seeing is the confluence of two conflicts between uh, Russia and other countries. The first one is the most obvious. It's a conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. And the fundamental question there is Ukraine's ability to pursue an independent path. Uh, without Russian control. The second conflict is with Western countries, those in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and the European Union, the EU. And here, I think there's a much broader question here, a broader effort, in my view, to overturn the post-Cold War settlement and the principles attached to it. In particular, uh, overturning the idea that the use of force is illegitimate in Europe for political purposes. And second, the freedom of ability, the freedom of states to affiliate uh, with Western institutions. Um, it, it, additionally, you know, when we think about the West's participation in this, while the uh, Western states have so far refused to uh, even consider putting the use of force in Ukraine on the table, there's a lot of sanctioning activity. Sanctions aren't necessarily effective compellent devices, but they can be effective deterrents. And I think this is really the second, this is the, the sanctioning really relates to the second conflict, the question of the freedom of states to essentially join the Western up. Lurking behind both of these conflicts is the question of whether or not Russia is a great power. Um, I think, uh, in my view, Putin and those around him are determined to ensure that Russia is treated as a great power, is viewed as a great power, uh, not just in the short term, but for the 21st century. So that's kind of my introduction to what's going on. Uh, certainly, some of my colleagues may well disagree with me. Certainly, you may all disagree with me. Our first uh, panelist today is Gary Adams, who, as I mentioned, is a uh, PhD student in our Security Studies PhD program. And his comments are really going to focus on uh, kind of updating you on the military situation in Ukraine. Um, can everyone hear me? Sorry, I've been having. Yes, uh, it's a little troublesome, but we can. We just heard you. Having some audio issues. Can you hear me? We are having some real issues, uh, both audio and I think your screen as well. Um, how about I temporarily change the order? Um, Can you guys so hear me? We do. I do. Yes.
Sorry, it's very broken up. Just go ahead and uh, we'll see what we can do. All right. Uh, oh, we'll make the best of it as we can, I guess. Uh, so I'm Gary Adams. Um, I, I couldn't hear anything basically that Dr. Dolan just said. So I'm a second year PhD student. I'm here being sponsored by the Air Force Institute of Technology's Advanced Academic Degree Program. I'm an active duty lieutenant colonel um, in the Air Force. And uh, I'm going to be providing you with your military perspective today. I'm just going to lead in with saying this is what I'm going to be talking about are basically my opinions based on the conversations I've had from my network and open source stuff that I have read. Um, for the past um, for the past month, and it's not to be representative of the larger US, USAF or uh, the DoD. Next slide. Um, so basically, what we have here is just kind of showing you a progression of how uh, Russian forces have been staged around Ukraine. What we can see is uh, prior to the buildup, we had some existing positions uh, on the, in the eastern flank, and then also down in Crimea. Um, especially after 2014. Uh, in December, uh, at the end of December, what we started to see is more Russian troops, uh, new positions coming in at the northeastern um, border there, and then also more down in Crimea as well. Uh, by the end of January, we saw uh, troop movements into Belarus, um, and then more, uh, yeah, and then uh, in the end of February, a couple of days before the invasion began, saw more troops move into Belarus, uh, more move into the northeastern uh, border there, and then also more move into uh, Crimea. Next slide. Um, this is just a breakdown of the differences in personnel and then uh, tanks, aircraft, and then also ships. As you can see, the Russia's, Russia's got a overwhelming force compared to uh, the Ukraine. Next slide. From here, um, this is Odor. So if you've been watching the news, you've probably seen this uh, slide um, somewhere. Uh, I'll let you read while I am just going through this. Uh, I'm gonna be going over basically what we've seen and what, what, uh, what I expect to happen based on the conversations I've had and then um, what the response of the Ukrainian forces uh, ha has been. So basically, we saw some pre-positioned forces under the guise of exercises. Obviously, those aren't true. Even though they did conduct an exercise, but we saw those more like a walkthrough of what was to come. Um, manufacturing false excuses to invade based on Nazism, rumors of ethnic cleansing, um, whether or not Ukraine was ever separated from Russia. We saw a lot of news as well from Putin. Um, in the opening hours and days, what we saw is uh, cyber attacks basically to overwhelm and confuse news and social media sites well within uh, uh, Ukraine, also to disrupt command and control systems of the government at large and also the military. Uh, followed that by uh, ballistic and cruise missile strikes from sea land and air weapon systems. What we saw yesterday was about 100 plus cruise missiles and at least 75 bomber sorties. And these are basically consolidated barracks, airfields, and also air defense systems. Um, what you should see in the next, um, um, coming days is uh, maintaining and sustaining a combat air patrol over Ukraine or to, to sustain air superiority. This was accomplished relatively yesterday, although they did not, um, the air campaign was not as robust as we perceived it, as we thought it would be. Um, we saw the ground invasion coming in from the Northeast and the South, as well as an amphibious landing at Odessa from the Black Sea. Um, what you're going to see is a race to cut off the key. I mean, if you've been watching the news today, it's essentially what's been going on. Uh, what they're going to use the armor and infantry to surround Kiev before they actually go in. And they're going to fight to get to um, leadership. There's some assumptions with this. Um, they're assuming that the center of gravity of uh, Ukraine, this military, basically its leaders in the capital city itself, and this may not be the case. Um, next slide. Oh, back up some. Yeah, uh, one more. Uh, one more, uh, two forward, sorry. <laughs> there you go. So this is what I expect. From the, from the conversations I've had, um, they pretty much agree more or less with what I initially thought was going to happen. They're going to push this around Kiev. They're going to push up into basically the Dnieper River. I don't expect uh, Russia to pu push any more to the west um, based on logistical reasons. 
and really no need to based on what they want to do, um, what they what they've been seeking to accomplish. They're going to push um, from the south north a little bit. That red line there, basically, to cut off Ukraine from the Black. Next slide. Um, this is just an overview of what you've probably seen in the news over um, some of the uh, NATO and U.S. forces that have been plussing up some of the uh, states that are bordering um, Russia and Ukraine right now, based in the Baltics, and Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and stuff like that. So um, this is part of a larger enhanced foreign presence strategy that NATO has been working on since 2016. So a lot of the forces that are coming from Europe and they're going toward um, the, uh, the Eastern Front there, that's, it's, it's based on they're going to be going to backfill those battalions that were already in place. Next slide. And then also this is a, basically a breakdown of what we should see uh, NATO um, and uh, versus Russia as far as capabilities. What we've seen essentially from uh, the Ukraine, I mean, it's been pretty astounding, obviously. I mean, they're completely outmatched. Um, however, they have um, amazing resolve. Um, so hearts and prayers out for those guys um, and guys who are fighting there. Um, so what they've done. So they have instituted con a conscription army from ages 18 to 60. They've distributed small arm fire, uh, small arms um, to civilians and basically told that they need to rise up and fight. Um, they've also, uh, uh, Russia yesterday um, captured uh, Antonov airfield. It was retaken by the Ukrainians and as of this morning, it was retaken by uh, Russia. Uh, what you also see is the destruction of bridges getting into and out of uh, the Kiev area and basically to uh, frustrate Russian approach into um, the capital city. Um, what you can also see um, in the coming days you're, as they approach the river and they approach Kiev, they, they are going to take a pause. They're going to they're going to consolidate their logistical lines and they're going to they're going to uh, they're, they're basically going to uh, solidify that logistical lines getting to and from um, the four line troops. Next slide, please. All right. So, what really should you be worried about? I mean, in my mind, uh, the most dangerous course of action is they don't stop at the river and they continue to push uh, west. Um, uh, based on Putin's speeches, I mean, over the last several years, you know that he wants to reunite. Uh, uh, he wants to restore Russia to its former um, glory days of the Soviet Union. There. Um, a mistake, a miscalculation from a Russian pilot or uh, a soldier or from Poland or Romania could kick off a larger battle. We fought wars for a lot less, so we need to be very wary of that. Also reports this morning that there were cyber attacks that actually spilled into the Baltics and that um, Russia had actually um, bombed a Turkish ship that was just off the coast of Odessa. Um, so some of those, those miscalculations and the mistakes are already happening. So we need to be paying very um, close attention to that as well. Next. Some issues that, that, that Europe's gonna have. Um, these are pipelines going into Europe um, from Russia. Um, so there is some, some wariness about whether or not, you know, um, if they decide to go into the Baltic states, what is NATO's actual response gonna be? Is it gonna be actual um, following through with Article 5 or is it gonna be something uh, more scaled back? Are they gonna be hesitant? Next slide. Then lastly, the larger um, issues out there, what we've seen is basically the pre-Olympic friendship message between Putin and Xi Jinping as well. What we've also seen, just talking uh, just, re um, just this morning, um, that we've also seen some uh, Russian troops being pulled off of its border with uh, China and being consolidated and moved to, uh, toward Eastern Europe as well. This is a signal that basically that there is trust building between the two countries. How much, I don't know. Um, but then pulling troops off of that, uh, that border there is quite the tell. Um, China yesterday obviously flew uh, aircraft, nine of them, fighter aircraft into Taiwanese airspace. And uh, something that I thought was very interesting uh, as far as timing wise goes, um, as far as them consolidating this with the, uh, the 2014 Olympics and then now right after the Olympics this year, but also right now the Russian Federation are the ones who's leading the, uni uh, the UN Security Council. Um, with that, uh, I apologize for going over time, but um, I'll take your questions at the end. 
Thanks very much, Gary. Next up, we'll hear from Michael Macedonia, who's an Associate Vice President for Research here at UCF. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I want to talk to you, essentially, I'll go back in history to come back forward in history. Is Back in 2017, the Army Science Board, which I was a member of, and I was a co-lead for a study on uh, future of war, character of future war. So yeah, Kevin, could you bring up the slides? I can do it if you want me to. Okay. All right, so um, I'm just gonna give you uh, the, essentially the headlines from the study in 2017. We had talked initially started off by talking to folks re regarding the 2014 Ukrainian Russia war. Uh, the, the, there, there were some key issues that came we, we identified. The first one was um, the operational impact of the cognitive dimension. The comp, basically, the next war, you know, this is 2017, would involve a, a, lot of, a lot of trying to dominate the cog, cognitive dimension and the discussion. Uh, Garaza, we looked at a lot of what Garazimov had to say. And the one thing that we picked out was the very rules of war have changed. The role of non-military means of achieving political and strategic goals has grown. <clears throat> I, I never would have thought back in 2017 that we would have former national security people actually praising Putin. So obviously they had a very effective capability in terms of influencing the cognitive domain, at least in NATO, uh, Europe and the United States. The other thing would be that uh, we, we, the United States was, had supremacy in all domains, but the world was moving to more lethal contested in all domains. I think the key thing here was that we saw the tactical engagements were gonna be very compressed in time, extended in space, more lethal. I mean, I, Ukraine is huge. It's a huge place. So the fact that, that they could operate in days through Ukraine is just amazing. Um, and that'll get to another issue. But the, the, the fact is, is the main supremacy has been content, contested uh, by the Ukrainians themselves. So uh, as, as uh, Gary was saying, is the, the Ukrainians have responded, basically have done, be done better against the Russian air operations. I think one lesson to learn, people recently learned from was the Azerbaijani uh, uh, and Aber uh, Azerbaijan conflict. The other thing that we saw in, back in 2017 was the operational impact of transparent war, that everything would be visible to satellites and, and second capabilities of both from using commercial and military means. And that has played out consistently. The one thing here that I, I, I wonder about though, it's been very transparent from the United States perspective and news, but I, I looked at Gary's chart. Nobody has a real good idea of what the order of battle is uh, in terms of the number of tanks. I've heard different numbers, 125 battalions, uh, but, but, it's, but, but I've heard that two thirds are still in Russia waiting for orders. There's very little discussion about logistics. They've extended their logistics enormously. You know, to go three, uh, uh, 200 miles into Ukraine, you've extended your logistics. I'm not sure that the Russians are that good at logistics, but that's a good point for discussion. The next thing would be battle, phase, battle space reconfiguration we looked at in 2017. That is, is in the past, cities were, were perceived as bad places to fight. If you're the, if you're on the offense, uh, we we saw that we saw that uh, essentially cities would be end up being your savior for logistics purposes because as countries would use cities as for foraging opportunities, and uh, we'll wait to see what happens 
when uh, when as this war progresses. The other one be is is and I think this is what the United States is co definitely concerned about is contested expeditionary operations. How, uh, the Russians can see basically the entire Europe airspace, uh, so they've probably watched every aircraft that we've sent into e Eastern Europe. So this is this is if anything would happen, it th that would be the first area of engagement because because obviously this is this would be something the United States has not done since World War II, which would be contested expeditionary operations. And then finally, we looked at three constraints to future war for the United States. The first, which has become evident, is fiscal constraints. They're talking about we have yet to pass an appropriations bill for the United States this year for the for DOD, and that's still hanging. Though I've been told it's supposed to come about here in the next in two weeks. Uh, ben Sass was on TV this morning, Senator Ben Sass, saying we need to have an emergency appropriations for military. That hasn't happened. That hasn't been proposed yet. I'm waiting for the president to say something about it. Um, I'll ignore that. Acquisition is, 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 some, is, is a nice to have if you have time to do it, but there's, you got to go to war with what you got. And finally is, is the legal and cultural asymmetries. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the Russians respond to, to, to basically a, a Ukrainian civilian population over time. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Next, we have uh, Dr. Miroslav Shapovalov. Thank you, Tom. I am going to share my screen. Also, if you could speak a wee bit louder. Sure, absolutely. Can you hear me now? Awesome. All right. So uh, I'm going to give you some information on the Ukrainian response so far and um, their future plans and potential developments in the country. And I apologize for looking at my phone so much. Uh, as you can understand, what's going on in Ukraine right now is a developing situation. And I've just gotten an update that um, apparently there is a dogfight happening in the skies of Odessa, which will possibly be followed by an amphibious landing, but we won't know that until early morning, because as you can understand, it's currently night in Ukraine. But uh, I'm going to agree with uh, the previous speaker. We, we do not necessarily know what is um, going on in terms of the order of battle. We, in particular, don't know uh, the dislocation and performance and the numbers of the Ukrainian troops, uh, which is, uh, I suppose, on purpose. Um, but from what we can see for now, I'm going to get my pointer here. Um, from what we can see, um, currently Ukraine is absorbing Russian attacks fairly well. Um, that's my take on it. Um, the military appears to be hosting, uh, holding rather the Eastern Front here uh, pretty well. There have not been many news coming out of that area. Uh, and this is where I would expect the majority of the Ukrainian military to be concentrated right now. The cities of Mariupol, which is over here, and also Kharkiv here, appear to be holding um, as well, uh, although for both cases, this is done at the expense of intense fighting and bombing. Uh, the outskirts of both cities are literally on fire right now. Um, the most disturbing situation for me would be the one in the south, because here right now, um, Ukrainians do not seem to have a um, strategy or tactics to contain the advancing Russian troops. Uh, right now, Russians are advancing on to the city of Kherson. They have captured one of the strategic uh, bridge crossings in the area and are going to uh, most likely advance into the city. As for the north, um, one of the most serious advances here has been the city of Sumy, which uh, Russians are using as one of the two staging points for their advance to Kiev. Here, um, as you have probably heard, Russians have captured uh, the Antonov International Cargo Airport, which has been retaken um, from them by the Ukrainian military 
last night, this night, earlier this morning. So what we can see is that Ukrainian military is able to score some victories, and those victories are pretty significant. Uh, the contingent of paratro Russian paratroopers in the airport was surrounded and um, completely eliminated, and we're talking about 200 uh, people there. Uh, the first Russian reconnaissance groups, which entered Kiev between 3 and 5 a.m. Eastern time, have been also neutralized and eliminated. So this um, performance has a debilitating effect on the morale of Russian troops. Uh, we keep seeing and keep hearing reports of Russian troops either surrendering, um, like one of the reconnaissance platoons of the 74th Brit motorized brigade of the Russian army, or fleeing and also leaving vehicles uh, behind for the Ukrainians to uh, then seize and confiscate them. Now, part of the reason and those of you who uh, are familiar with the recent Russian um, Ukrainian history, I'm talking about 2014 and their conflict with Russian proxies. Uh, part of the reason the Ukrainian troops is performing so much better than back then is because Ukrainian civilians this time are fully mobilized and are fully contributing to the war effort. There is no panic in Ukrainian cities. Uh, the emergency services are working. Uh, police and the National Guard intercept continuously uh, Russian saboteurs and terrorists. We have seen several reports of uh, attempts to plant bombs in uh, public spaces in the southern cities and in the cities in the west, such as Ivana Frankivsk and uh, even Lviv, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, more importantly, the civilians are pulling together resources. And here we're talking about supplies money, even blood donations. Uh, there are no issues with those. So in difference from 2014, it is very clear who the enemy is this time. There are no questions about political orientations of your neighbor. This time it's Russians, plain and simple. And now Ukrainian cities have, frankly speaking, the tools to deal with them. We have functioning police, we have the uh, National Guard, which uh, is I guess, serves as the military police and has been uh, reactivated in 2014. So as of right now, it is not necessarily clear how the situation will develop. Um, the Russian advances in the South, as I said, being more concerning for me at least than anything else. Um, so far, the Ukrainian military has been successful at holding the ground and also eliminating the incursions and attempts at establishing Russian beachheads in the North, uh, case in point, the Antonov International Airport. Um, even the Ukrainian aviation seems to be, Air Force rather, excuse me, seems to be performing better than uh, Western uh, analysts uh, expected at the time. Now, the battle for Kiev, which will either commence soon or already has commenced, um, I suspect will be the turning point in this uh, Russian military campaign. And after that, if Ukrainians are successful at uh, defending the town, may focus on trying and retake the positions that Russian forces have occupied up until this point. Um, the interesting thing about how the situation has been developing up until now is that despite the numerical and technological advances that Russians have, um, they so far have managed a slow advance with comparably big casualties um, in conventional and open field environments, right? Something Russian military is trained to operate in. So when we, th when we think about Kiev in urban warfare in this context, then fighting uh, Ukrainian military, Ukrainian National Guard, and the denizens of the city, which, as was said before, are now um, getting armed with AK-47s and Molotov cocktails, uh, is going to be an incredibly bloody affair. I am honestly not sure Russian troops are ready for. Um, one crucial difference uh, that we keep seeing on the battlefield and also in the social sphere, social media, the um, communication within the country, is that the Russian troops did not seem to have a strong enough stomach for prolonged continuous battles, whereas Ukrainians continue to maintain incredible resolve under the circumstances. And when you think about that, the most likely outcome, um, for me at least, seems that um, Ukrainians will 
outlast Russians in their result to continue fighting. And uh, I also suspect that taking Kiev, even after it is surrounded, is not going to be such an easy task. But that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Professor Vladimir uh, Solonari, who is a professor of history specializing in Russia, uh, I believe. Vladimir. Hello. Could you start my um, PowerPoint? Thank you. Actually, I specialized in the Soviet history, which includes Ukraine too. So, um, and uh, as a historian, I, 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 I want to focus on the uses and abuses of history. And when I talk about the abuses of history, I mean basically the abuses by the Russian side, by the Russian propaganda, and in particular, by President Putin himself, who in the summer of this year published a crazy long article about how we, what Ukraine is, what it's supposed to be, what it's what is what it is not. And um, um, this um, fairly liberated in his uh, um, addresses to the Russian nation, explaining why uh, he decided to invade Ukraine. And then those things uh, have been elaborated upon by the uh, Russian propaganda and Russian TV, uh, Russian press, uh, Russian radio hosts. Um, basically, the major argument that um, both Putin and uh, Sycophants are making is that Ukraine is not really a legitimate nation, that it was created by um, the Russian state, because the Russian Zarist imperial state and then Russian Soviet state. And um, that in this way, uh, it should not exist. It should, or it, if it exists, it's only under the Russian uh, dominion should exist, as a kind of uh, not exactly sovereign state. The map that I'm showing here under the heading bad history, supposed to illustrate this main territory. It claims that the real, in uh, quote unquote, right, uh, quote unquote, uh, Ukrainian territory is this little part of the territory. And the year is 1654. This is the year when the Cossack host uh, as kind of a parliamentary territory which existed within the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, but eventually fought uh, for uh, uh, the independence, uh, revolted against the Polish kings and fought against. Uh, them uh, for the independence of um, Orthodox, uh, Christian Orthodox lands. Um, but uh, eventually they um, seceded from it and decided to ask Russian Vlad to take them uh, as they put it under their own hand. Otherwise they didn't feel able to liberate themselves. And this is the territory that they uh, control at the time. So, this is the territory which is real Ukraine, they say. Now, um, of course, um, what follows then as this yellow is the territory where, uh, annexed by, by the Russians as from um, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, in the later century, in the uh, 18th century, and then uh, even greater territory in the South, including Crimea, from uh, the Ottoman Empire. So uh, it says that this is how Russia has created Ukraine. Right? The problem with this history is, of course, that these territories indeed were annexed, but they were not added to the Ukrainian territory, but they were added to the Russian Empire, who didn't care about Ukraine. And in fact, even Ukrainian autonomy was uh, initially uh, restricted and eventually uh, liquidated completely. So these territories were added to the Russian Empire and uh, in no way the Russians has added them to the Ukra to Ukraine. Can you now go to the next slide? Sorry, Tom, can we go to the next slide? Yes, this is the uh, other map, which also kind of comes from um, Russian propaganda, but in contradicts the previous map. And it shows how uh, Ukraine was created by the Soviets. Now here, the map is in Russian, but uh, it doesn't really matter because it shows much of the same territory uh, with some slight changes. And I want to draw your attention. So indeed uh, to them, um, what this map shows that 
the Ukraine, if it was created, the borders of today's uh, Ukraine were created um, by the Soviets, only in the sense that the Soviets uh, um, delimited those borders of Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, which still was under the uh, Moscow communist leadership, based on the ethnic principle, ethnographic principle, where the um, uh, ethnic Ukrainians predominated. And what this map shows in this eastern corner, southeastern corner of it, is a territory which was included in, initially in, in Ukrainian SSR in 1924, and then excluded from it, but other smaller pieces of land added in the 20, 25, 26, right? Uh, to that based on different considerations, uh, partially uh, economic, partially um, just um, the um, uh, kind of to make the borders more simple, right? Uh, but part of this uh, territory was excluded. And so uh, in fact, um, a part of Ukraine was um, given to, back to Russia to the Russian Federation, right? As it was also then belonged to the same Soviet state, but nevertheless. Uh, now the uh, Western territories and Southwestern territories were those who were annexed by the Soviet Union for the neighboring Poland, Czechoslovakia and Romania during and after World War II. And of course those territories, although were they included in Ukraine, again, based on the ethnographic principle, um, um, Basically, they, uh, the, the idea was that they were included first and foremost within the Soviet empire. And so the expansion of the Ukrainian territory was the afterthought. Uh, the initial aim of the Soviet state was the extension of the Soviet empire. But uh, ultimately, fundamentally, the borders of most of Ukraine were defined by the ethnographic principle where the Ukrainians predominated there or as the Russians predominated there. This is the same principle on, uh, on the basis of which uh, most of East and Central European states were um, uh, established, the borders of those states were established following World War I. So this is a completely legitimate principle. The only territory which was ordered uh, on some other principle and we did in contradiction to this principle is the Crimean uh, Peninsula uh, so-called uh, oblast, which was added by the decision of the Supreme Soviet during Khrushchev time. Uh, for, um, it was cut off from um, Russian Federation added to Ukrainian SSR, but on the considerations of economic principle, because Crimea was connected economically more to Ukraine. This is the only uh, area in which this principle, ethnographic principle was violated. Can we go now to the next um, couple of um, uh, 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 slides. So now I am uh, turning to what really matters, the history which really matters. And um, this is the history that shows how the borders of Ukraine, independent Ukraine, were defining how Ukraine imagined the in independent state after uh, the downfall of the Soviet Union. And what is important is here that uh, Ukraine was established as a result of the free expression uh, of the will of its people and in accordance with the uh, um, principle of re reciprocal recognition by the leaders of the Russian Federation, its legitimate borders and Ukraine following the downfall of the Soviet Union. The um, most important that's here are August 24th was the Supreme Rada, this the Parliament of Ukraine adopted uh, the act of independence, which was then confirmed by the uh, referendum of the Ukrainian population, more than 90% voted in favor. And then following this decision and provoked largely by this decision, the leaders of a Russian Federation, yet so President Yeltsin of the time, Ukrainian and Belarus decided to dissolve the Soviet Union in, in, in a manner which one can argue was not completely legitimate, but then because it, the decision was ratified by the parliaments of U Ukraine and of the Russian Federation and other Soviet republics joined in, it kind of became, became the fight that accompli and became completely uh, legitimized by um, the decision of the legitimate body, 
bodies. Now let us move to the last slide. And of course, the uh, most important pact, maybe the most important pact um, in this history that matters, this is the Budapest uh, Memorandum, of which now many people talk. And let me just remind the audience of what it was about. It was about the very important issue of what will happen with, uh, what would happen with the nuclear weapons, which uh, not only Russian Federation, but um, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan inherited from the Soviet Union. So um, had the Budapest Memorandum not signed and not acted upon, Ukraine now would have been a nuclear power, as well as Belarus and Kazakhstan on par with the Russian Federation. Now, that was, of course, a um, prospect which terrified many decision makers, not only in Russia, but also in the West. And they reached this agreement that Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan would uh, transport their nuclear weapons, hand them all over to the Russian Federation, we should destroy them according to the agreement with the Americans in exchange for recognition and guarantees extended to Ukraine by Russia, US, and UK, other nuclear powers. Uh, not exactly recognition, but the promise, not the guarantee, sorry, but the promise not to violate Ukrainian uh, sovereignty. Now, when Putin talks about history, this is, of course, a reading, um, a very selective reading of history and a completely wrong reading of history because what happened in the past actually doesn't really matter. Uh, from this reading, Ukraine completely is a completely legit legitimate um, state recognized by the Russian Federation and uh, also uh, the state which agreed to weaken its defenses in exchange of the promise for, of Russia to respect its territorial integrity and sovereignty. And so when Russia decided to violate this sovereignty, it violated international norms and um, also uh, the sanctity of international treaties. And let me remind you as a historian, uh, it, to me it's kind of very vivid that World War I uh, started with a crime. Germany invaded Belgium and this crime brought Great Britain into the fray. And that eventually brought Germany uh, down. So the sanctity of international treaties is not something which could and should be taken lightly. This is something that provoked the First World War. And one can say provoked the Second World War. I don't want to continue this discussion. So what we are facing here is something that the world cannot ignore, whatever Putin says. It is absolutely essential to the preservation of international peace and international order as we know it. it this fact cannot be ignored. And because of this, because, just because of this, if we are not even talking about the consequences in terms of the uh, loss of human rights and economic destruction and everything else, just because of this, because Putin violated the sacred promise of the Russian integration, he deserves, and his country deserves uh, to be punished severely. And I, 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 I say it's not only in order to stop the war, but also to punish, to teach the lesson, both to the Russians and to the rest of the world. We cannot live in the world which is ruled by the law of jungle. We should live in the world which is based on international norms and the, uh, the rule of law. This, what, what, two world wars we fought for that. We cannot let it happen right now. This is so important. Russian people need to understand. Everybody in, in the world needs to, to understand. Putin already got this matter with Crimea when invited uh, Ukrainian. This is the second time. And this is the moment of truth when the whole world must be united against the aggressor. This is an absolute necessity, vital necessity for the future of humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. <clears throat> Last we'll hear from uh, Professor Michael Musso. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> I'll, try to, uh, uh, I'll try to answer three questions that come from a recent article in International Security that came out in 2019 that are all relevant to what's happening now. And I'll try to do this as quickly as I can. I know we're running out of time. <clears throat> so first question is, 
we might be interested in why is Putin doing this? And in order to understand why Putin is doing this, I argue we need to understand Russia's, the nature of Russia's domestic economy, which is not a rule-based market-based system, but rather it's a feudal oligarchic type of system based on relationships. And as a consequence, anthropologists call this a gift-giving type economy. And in this kind of economy, um, people, uh, identity matters because when whatever relationship matters, identity matters. And so identity is what holds the system together. And in particular, keeps the vast majority of Russians who are at the bottom of this oligarchic rank feudal system, it keeps them compliant if you press the identity. So what I've argued is that these types of economic systems inherently have to be um, expansionist in their foreign policy, because that's keyed to uh, reinforcing the identity which keeps the populace um, you know, happy, content. It's, it's key to the stability of the whole system. Now, the argument I'm, I'm, I made is actually not a, a radical argument. Um, a, a form of it was George Kennan's argument that laid the basis for the Cold War and the United States foreign policy for um, all through the Cold War. The difference between Kennan's, uh, you know, Kennan's argument and my own is Kennan was a Sovientologist. And he argued that the reason the Soviets need to expand and need foreign conflict is because it's something particular about the Soviet Communist Party. What I argue is actually it's rooted more in the economic system. And so therefore it also applies across the world. So other examples um, today with feudal systems where they have to have an expansionist foreign policy and aggressive foreign policy would be Iran, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, and there are others. So this is my argument for why Putin is engaging in this. The implication is this conflict will continue for a while. A second question that I think is worth seeking to answer is why is much of the world, especially the industrial democracies, so unified? I see so much on TV about, you know, this is a surprise because usually they're, you know, they don't know what they're doing together. Um, what I argued in this article is there's a natural unification of these countries in favor of the principle of self-determination for all countries, large and small around the world. And this value within these countries is rooted deep within their economies. It's rooted in their voters who are used to following a rule-based um, global system and intuitively reject someone who violates the rules and then acts as a bully against others. It's rooted in the commercial, influential commercial in, uh, interests in these countries um, who understand that a global rules-based system is far more profitable than um, a chaotic system. Um, and then it's also rooted in the leaders of the industrial democracies who understand that economic growth is crucial for the re-election prospects and economic growth is about global order, not disorder. So then moving on to the third question, um, um, that I'd like to uh, ponder is um, then what is the appropriate, given those, those first two, what is the appropriate allied um, reaction here? And in, here we need to think about the global implications of what, of what we do. And in particular, we need to think about Taiwan. Um, the Chinese leadership are looking at this very closely. Um, they want Taiwan, and they obviously have a much stronger legal basis for taking Taiwan, which is not a sovereign country, than Russia has um, for taking or interfering um, in, in Ukraine. However, there's a big difference between China's leadership and Russia's leadership. China has, the Chinese autocratic leaders have built a rules-based, market-based system within China, which means that their legitimacy is not based on expansion and ideology. Their legitimacy is based on success in the performance of creating economic growth for the Chinese people. And herein lies the key, I argue, for why they have not so far taken Taiwan, because they are integrated in the global economy and they fear the sanctions and the resulting loss of economic growth that will happen um, if they go for Taiwan. And so they're watching this very closely. If the allied countries respond lightly to Putin's imperial actions, the Chinese will see this and they will realize, oh, we might be able to take Taiwan and maintain our economic growth. And so 
we, we need to be strong. I advocate very strong sanctions, including getting off of Russian oil and gas to severely punish Russia. Um, and I argue that it's not about Taiwan or Ukraine per se. It's about the global order. Because if we don't take strong actions, we are going to be in the 1930s all over again. This is the core lesson of the 1930s that was embraced after World War II, which was when you have an expansionist power, you need to understand that expansionist power is a rational actor. They're just expansionist. So therefore, in order to avoid war and promote a global world of self-determination, you need to resist expansionist acts um, but do so push back, not too strong that you get to war, but always push back and punish. And then as long as you understand that you're dealing with a rational actor that will, re that will um, react to being pushed back, then you maintain that, you have patience and you wait it out. That was how the Cold War was won and that's how this can be won. So those are my arguments um, about what is going on here on the political side and what I think the allied countries need to do. Thank you very much, Michael. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, to this point. I think we've had some really interesting contributions. Um, Gary and Michael both gave us a, a really great uh, description of what's going on, and, and Miroslav as well, a really great description of uh, what's going on in terms of the actual military aspects, how this conflict is similar to and different from previous military aspects. Uh, Professor, Professor Solinar, uh, Solinari's uh, discussion really speaks to the, the I think the wrong, fundamental wrongheadedness of the of Putin's account, uh, which he's personally making uh, for why uh, Ukraine shouldn't exist and why Russia should essentially have these rights over the rest. And 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 lastly, Michael, uh, Professor Rousseau's um, uh, great discussion of how you know these issues are not just um, issues of one person, but reflect kind of whole systems of like, uh, order and ideas about how government relates to individuals um, and, and how those translate into uh, offensive actions. So, so I'd like to thank uh, all of our participants